All right. So our program this evening is Pat Connery's Reverence for Teaching. And this is a program I've gotten to present a couple of times for lifelong learning classes and for teachers and for students and at libraries all across South Carolina and Georgia. And this is an enjoyable uh, one for me to give because it's about the Pat I very much want to learn more about, and that's Pat Conroy as teacher and student. So this is our guy, and this is probably a face that's quite familiar to many of you, Pat Conroy, uh, born October 26, 1945. We're actually coming up on Pat's 70th birthday right now. Was the author of 12 books, 11 published during his lifetime, and then a 12th, The Little Country Heart, came out after he passed away. You're probably familiar with many of these books, but you're probably most familiar with the four that were made into major motion pictures. First was Conrack, based on Pat's memoir, The Water Is Wide. That film was released in 1974. It was filmed just down the coast of Georgia, not far from where we are here in Beaufort. And then in 1979 was the film version of The Great Santini, which was actually filmed right here in Beaufort. The Lords of Discipline was released in 1983. And The Prince of Tides in 1991, also filmed primarily right here in Beaufort. What all of these films and all of their corresponding books have in common, and what indeed all of Pat's books. Back to ideas of education and the relationships between students and teachers. And that's because that was so central to Pat's own life. And that's really the Pat I want to talk to you about this evening. So here's another photo of Mr. Conroy. Uh, that's him in the back, obviously. It's a photo taken in 1968. Pat was 23 years old. He had just finished his first year of teaching at that point. Uh, those are Pat's parents up in the front there. It's uh, Mother Peg Conroy on one side and Father Colonel Don Conroy on the other. And Pat is uh, surrounded by his other six siblings there. And there's a quote I'm sure you can see at the bottom there. This is from Pat's uh, memoir, The Death of Santini. For a long time, I thought I was born into a mythology instead of a family. Pat grew up thinking everything was larger than life because his own family seemed to be so larger than life. His father, the Colonel, was one of the most highly decorated Marine fighter pilots of his generation. Uh, the Colonel served with distinction in World War II in Korea as a member of the Black Sheep Squadron and then two tours of duty in Vietnam. Don had clearance to deliver atomic weapons. That's how good of a fighter pilot he was. He was also a uh, really wonderful training officer. And because of that, the family was moved around from base to base uh, while Pat was growing up. Don, unfortunately, uh, was also one of these guys who could not leave the battle on the battlefield. He was physically and verbally abusive to this whole family. And Pat, as the oldest, was the firstborn. Uh, and Pat's mother, Peg, got the worst of that. So Pat grew up as a child of abuse. The counterbalance to the physicality and the violence of his father was his mother. And Here's some other photos of Peg, and that is indeed adorable baby Pat Conroy that she's holding in her arms there. Peg grew up in the backwoods beyond the backwoods in rural Alabama and Georgia without much access to public education. In The Death of Santini, uh, Pat writes about looking for evidence that his mother graduated from high school and not being able to find it. He found evidence that she attended, but it's entirely possible she did not graduate although she told the family many times over that she had, and for a brief period in her life, she was able to convince a lot of people she was a college graduate. And the reason she was able to do that was because she was so incredibly well-read. She found her way to libraries and librarians at a young age, <clears throat> and they filled in the gaps that, <clears throat> uh, the gaps in her education. So she was in many ways self-educated, and she found books a way to, uh, a path to self-improvement uh, and self-empowerment as well. And those were lessons she started instilling in her children at a very young age. There was one book that was particularly meaningful to Peg and she started reading it to Pat and his younger sister, Carol Ann, <clears throat> uh, when Pat was five years old. So the age that Pat is in that middle photograph there. And it was this book, Gone with the Wind, uh, which incidentally is not age appropriate reading for a five-year-old. It's not in 1950 is not today, but Peg was really moved by this book. <clears throat> so much so that she had changed her middle name from Dorothy to Margaret because of Margaret Mitchell. And she went by Peg or Peggy her whole life, uh, inspired by this book. She read it to Pat and his sister Carol in a really empowering way too. Uh, if you're familiar with this book, you probably remember a few of the characters who are central to it, but really there's close to a hundred characters over the course of this novel, many of them with very relatively minor roles. 
But there was no character in Gone with the Wind that Peg could not equate with a real person from the Conroy's lives, either a family member or a friend or a neighbor. So at a very young age, five years old, Pat is learning that it's not as though literature is separate from life. They are interwoven ideas. Uh, and this book is the way that Peg teaches that to Pat. So a few years later, um, this is very influential to Pat as student as well. This is Pat in 1961. This is the year the Conroy family moved to Beaufort, South Carolina. It was the 23rd time the family had moved since Pat had been born. That's how often this family was moving. That was the military brat lifestyle that Pat grew up in. Beaufort High School was the 10th school that Pat went to in 1961. He was 16 years old, about to begin his junior year. Uh, so he had always been the new kid, had been a new school every single year always shy, always awkward, always forgettable because he had never been in any one town and one school long enough to make any friends or really to draw the attention of any teachers or mentors. All of that changes in Buford. Buford is the first public school that Pat ever went to as well. He'd been raised Roman Catholic like his dad, so he'd been going to private schools, to Catholic schools until this point. And when they arrive in Buford in 61, they know that the Colonel's appointment at the air station, his assignment at the air station, it's going to be for two years. Uh, this is just before the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's why it's so important to have a guy like Don Conroy at the Marine Corps Air Station here in Beaufort at this point. So Pat shows up in Beaufort knowing he's going to have his junior year and senior year at Beaufort High, and he's going to graduate from Beaufort High. So having two years at one school with one group of students, one group of teachers, one town he's absolutely in love with makes a lot of things happen for Pat in a very short period of time that probably wouldn't have happened anywhere else. He becomes a standout athlete, and by his senior year, he's captain and MVP of the basketball team. He's a point guard, same position he'll play in college at the Citadel, where he will also be a captain and MVP by the time he graduates uh, from college for senior year at the Citadel. He is also, are you ready for this, senior class president, Mr. Congeniality, best all around, as I said, captain and MVP of the basketball team. He's in the National Honor Society. He's playing other sports as well. He's the making, he's absolutely every single thing you can be at Beaufort High School because school then as it is now is so incredibly welcoming to military families. It's also at Beaufort High School where Pat's literary career begins because Beaufort High had then a literary magazine uh, called The Breakers. And in his junior year, Pat Conroy is published for the very first time at 16, maybe 17 years old. At that point in his life, he wants very much to be a poet. And those are the pieces he's submitting and having accepted for publication and breakers. And it means so much to young Pat Conroy to be published, to be read by someone outside his circle of friends and family members, that by his senior year, he joins the editorial staff of Breakers Literary Magazine. And that's the photograph we're looking at right now. So at 17, maybe 18 years old, Pat Conroy has already decided he wants to be a writer who helps other writers. And that's the whole arc of the rest of his life. It begins because of Beaufort High School. It's also worth noting that of these five students that we're looking at right here, three out of five of them go on to have literary careers, not just Pat. So he's meeting other kids his own age who have the same kind of ambitions and are walking the same kind of path that he is. Next to Pat there's Julie Zakowski. She goes on to be the librarian at Beaufort High School and later the library director for the entire county. Um, and she's still here in Beaufort in her retirement. She and Pat become lifelong friends as well. In the middle of our photograph is another military brat. That's Stephanie Austin Edwards. She leaves Buford after graduating from high school and goes on to have a remarkable career in Broadway and in Hollywood as a costumer, as a dancer, all sorts of wonderful things that bring her into the lives of some of the major celebrities of our time. But she comes back to Buford in the 1990s, uh, very much wanting to be a writer, wanting to return to this love that she had as a student about the same time that Pat comes back actually when he's working on beach music and they become friends all over again. Stephanie's now a published novelist and she runs uh, the writer's group that meets here at the Conroy Center as well. And I'll circle back around to Stephanie uh, at the end of the presentation as well. She connects to another part of our story. But this is important to note that young Pat Conroy, because of Buford High School, is finding a safe and supportive place where he can start to figure out whether or not he's serious about being a writer and because these resources are there, he's able to be published for the first time. He's able to help other kids be published, which is very important to young Pat. 
Well, beyond the students of Buford High, the teachers are quite important uh, to shaping the man that Pat Conroy will become as well. And this is one of the central figures in the life of teenage Pat Conroy. This is Gene Norris, who was Pat's high school English teacher his junior year and really became a lifelong mentor to Pat. And here's what Pat had to say about Gene. His eloquence was so understated that it was almost unnoticeable. He displayed a complete assurance in the composure and ease he brought to the art of teaching. At the end of the first day, I was impressed with the man. By the end of the first week, I was in love with him. He taught his students a language that was fragrant with beauty, treacherous with loss, comfortable with madness and despair, and a catchword for love itself. I'm gonna point out something in this passage, and I'm gonna leave you all to spot it from this point onward. And that's that second to last word, love. Uh, Pat Conroy can very rarely write about teaching without also writing about love. Those are intertwined ideas for him. And that's something he also learned from Gene. Well, Gene did a couple of things uh, in his classroom that Pat Conroy would later replicate as well. Uh, and one of those things was to bring classical music into the classroom. Uh, he was really sort of interdisciplinary teacher. And this is something that Pat would do later on on Defusky Island as well. But the other big thing that Gene did for Pat, which proved to be really essential to shaping Pat, was take him on field trips. Gene believed wholeheartedly that education happened in the classroom up to a point, but it really happened in the world. And one of those field trips that was particularly important to Pat. When Gene realized that Pat not only wanted to be a writer, but actually had the potential to become a writer, thought it was gonna be really important to introduce Pat to another writer. And indeed the first living writer Pat Conroy ever met, this man right here, Archibald Rutledge, who was South Carolina's first poet laureate. Uh, Mr. Rutledge was writing poetry, short stories, memoirs. A lot of his works were being published in what at the time were called boys adventure magazines. So Pat was already very familiar with a lot of Mr. Rutledge's writing. Uh, Pat was 16 years old when his teacher, Gene Norris, uh, took him to meet Mr. Rutledge. And Mr. Rutledge is probably 83 years old at that point, living at Hampton Plantation, which is not far from where you all are at. Um, and you may have been out there yourselves. It's now a state park located between uh, Charleston and Myrtle Beach. But that afternoon when Pat Conroy showed up, Mr. Rutledge, uh, for reasons we may never fully understand, decided to spend the whole afternoon with young Pat, walking him around the grounds of Hampton Plantation telling him the stories behind the names of the flora and fauna, telling him the history of the property, how Francis Mary and the Swamp Fox had crossed those lands during the American Revolution. At the end of the afternoon, Mr. Rutledge took Pat into Mr. Rutledge's writing room, uh, where we see him seated at that chair in the photograph, he pulled out a notepad, and he showed young Pat Conroy a poem uh, that Rutledge was writing, an unfinished, unpublished piece. And he asked 16 year old Pat Conroy, what would you do to improve this poem? Literature can always be made better. Well, Pat Conroy was floored. He was just amazed that the most famous writer in the state of South Carolina was asking his opinion. And he muttered out something about making a stronger rhyme at the end of the poem. I'd love to know if Archibald Rutledge took that advice. I'd love to know if somewhere out there was a poem written by Archibald Rutledge, but kind of sort of influenced by teenage Pat Conroy, because that'd be a pretty remarkable discovery. On the ride back home, uh, Gene, our teacher, asked young Pat, what did you learn today? Which is a good question for any teacher to ask any student. And Pat, uh, very much like students today, thought his assignment was to simply parrot back things that Gene had said. So he starts telling, um, or Rutledge had said rather, he starts telling Gene, you know, the stories behind flora and fauna uh, on the property, why a Cherokee rose is called a Cherokee rose. And he starts to tell them about Francis Marion crossing the property during the American Revolution. And Gene, being a remarkable teacher, says to young Pat Conroy, no, no, no. That is not what you learned today. That was not the big lesson. Archibald Rutledge, most famous writer in the state of South Carolina, just showed you how a writer treats another writer. He just showed you how a writer treats a no account, snot nosed 16 year old kid who has the same ambitions he once had as a boy. And in that car with his teacher, Gene Norris, 16 year old Pat Conroy said this If I ever get to be a writer, I'll be nice to every kid I meet. Well, that is an easy thing to say when you're 16 and you can't quite imagine it actually happening. 
But it does happen to Pat Conroy, and he holds true to this oath in some pretty remarkable ways, not just with every kid he meets, but with every writer he meets as well. Um, pretty remarkable experience for young Pat Conroy to have, and it shapes him from that point forward. It was a remarkable gift for Gene uh, to give him in this field trip. And because of that, and because of so many other things, Gene and Pat become lifelong friends well after this year they spend together in the classroom. You see a couple of photos of them on screen right now. And the one where they're both wearing tuxedos, they're obviously at an award ceremony, but it's not an award for Pat Conroy. This is Gene Norris getting a Lifetime Achievement Award from South Carolina's Teachers Association. In the other photograph where we see Pat in his suspenders phase, they're actually in Barbara Streisand's New York apartment after the film premiere of Prince of Tides. That day was so important to Pat, he wanted his teachers there with him. Uh, including Gene Morris. The other guy in that photograph pointing to Pat's tie is another one of his teachers. Uh, that is this guy right here, Bill Duffert, who was the principal at Buford High School when Pat was a student. And here's what Pat had to say about Mr. Duffert. I was in the middle of a childhood being raised by a father I didn't admire. In a desperate way, I needed the guidance of someone who could show me another way of becoming a man. But sometime during that year when I decided I would become the kind of man that Bill Duffert was born to be, I wanted to be the type of man that a whole town could respect and honor and fall in love with the way Buford did when Bill Duffert came to town to teach and shape and turn their children into the best citizens they could be. That's from an essay called The Summer I Met My First Great Man, which appears in Pat's book, The Low Country Heart. It's also a really wonderful chapter about Bill Duffert in the Pat Conroy cookbook. Also talking about this summer. And the summer Pat is referring to is the summer between his junior and senior years of high school. At that point, his father, the Colonel, wanted all the Conroy kids who were old enough to volunteer in some way in town to give back to the local community. And Pat decided to volunteer at Buford High School, same school he went to. So that summer he worked side by side with Bill Dufford, doing landscaping on the property, painting and repairing desks and bookshelves, doing all sorts of manual labor in the morning. At midday, uh, they would go to lunch at a restaurant that unfortunately no longer exists on Bay Street, about a block from where I am. And they would talk about the issues of the day. At that point, uh, the big issue of the day was the coming of integration. And Duffert had been raised in Jim Crow South and was not at that point open to the idea of integration. But Pat, who had been in all these other towns, all these other schools, had already had an integrated education at many of them, at many of the Catholic schools he went to. So he was able to tell Bill Duffert what that was like. And this starts to change Bill Duffert's mind. Um, which is important. If you think about it, there's about a 20 year age difference between these two men, but they're talking to each other peer to peer and Bill Dufford is listening to what Pat has to say. And Pat is seeing how well respected Bill Dufford is, not just in the school, but in the town. And he's starting to envision what it might be like to be the leader of a community as well. So Dufford is teaching him that by example. And these two become lifelong friends as well, uh, inspired in part because of these conversations with, Bill Duff, uh, with Pat Conroy, Bill Dufford goes back to college as well, gets a doctorate in education at the University of Florida, comes back to South Carolina and becomes one of the uh, unsung heroes of successful school integrations across the state of South Carolina. In that black and white photo, we see him with Dr. Earl Vaughn. They are in Sumter, South Carolina, and doing a remarkable integration of the high schools there that actually gets covered in the New York Times. And in the photo where we see Pat and Bill together, that's once again an award ceremony, and once again, it's not an award for Pat Conroy. This is Bill Dufford getting uh, the South Carolina Governor's Award in Humanities for his 40-year career in public education. Pat wanted to be there to not only uh, congratulate Bill Dufford, but to introduce him that afternoon as well. This is Pat just before his 70th birthday, Bill Dufford just before his 90th birthday. Dr. Dufford's still around, 93 years old still actively involved in education in his hometown of Newberry, South Carolina. And he too is a figure we'll circle back around to later on in the presentation. So we met a couple of men, but our story really needs a woman. And here is a remarkable one I want to introduce you to. Her name is Ann Head. And she was Pat Conroy's first creative writing teacher. And she was born to an old established family here in Buford and had published short stories and a couple of novels under the name Ann Head. And then she had remarried uh, Dr. Morris. So when Pat knew her, she was Mrs. Morris or Mrs. M as he called her. And Jean Norris, uh, Pat's junior English teacher, uh, recruited Ann Head, Mrs. Morris, 
to be the first creative writing teacher that Buford High ever had, in part because of Pat Conroy and five other students that Jean had who showed remarkable aptitude as writers. But Jean was first and foremost a teacher of literature, not of creative writing. He wanted these students to be taught by a real writer. So he got his friend Anne Head to come in and teach this creative writing class. Pat's father, the Colonel, uh, wanted Pat to grow up to be a fighter pilot, just like dear old dad. And he thought nothing could be more useless for my future fighter pilot son than a creative writing class. So Don actually forbid Pat from taking this class. But um, to our lasting benefit, Anne had immediately recognized Pat's potential and she very much wanted him to take the class. So they agreed that Pat would take it in secret and just not tell his dad and Pat wouldn't be listed on the official roster. Uh, but Anne Head was not a trained teacher the way that Jean Norris and Bill Dufford were. She was not all warm and fuzzy the way that they were. So Pat had a different kind of relationship with her. And here's how he described it in the chapter about her from the cookbook. On first sight, Mrs. Morris projected a steely withholding and icy reserve that would have been off-putting to me, except for the thrilling fact she was the first novelist I'd ever met in the flesh. She looked like a woman who would not tolerate a preposition at the end of a sentence or the anarchy of a dangling participle. She actually seems quite cold and off-putting to Pat, unlike Jean, unlike Bill, and like many of his teachers. But what Pat realizes over time is that the real Mrs. M, the real Anne Head, emerges on the page. She was most herself when she was writing. And because of that, she and Pat become remarkable pen pals after he graduates from Buford High School. He goes to the Citadel, as you probably all know, and there Pat continues writing poetry, just as he had done in high school. And he is sending these poems back to Buford, back to Mrs. M to critique for him, and she's always supportive. And frankly, that's not uh, very easy to do, because Pat's poetry is not very good at that point. I want to give you one example of that. This is a poem that Pat wrote um, at the Citadel his freshman year, his knob year, as it's called, at the Citadel. And at that point uh, in time, your job as a freshman, as a knob, was to be invisible, was not to do anything that would draw unnecessary, unwanted attention from the upper classes because you were going to get enough abuse from them already. Mr. Conroy took a slightly different approach to that when this poem was published in the Shaco, the literary magazine at the Citadel. And he became immediately famous, perhaps even infamous. The poem's just four lines long, and this is it. The dreams of youth are pleasant dreams of women, vintage, and the sea. Last night I dreamt I was a dog who found an upperclassman tree. Well, you can imagine how popular this makes Pat among the upperclassmen. But the thing is, you don't have to imagine it because he wrote about it in a letter to Mrs. M, to Anne Head, uh, which I have access to. So I want to share that with you in Pat's own writing. This is what he wrote uh, to Mrs. M about having that poem published. It was one of two he had in that issue of the Shaco. The poems have been published, and one of them was nearly a preamble to my obituary. I was getting ready for noon formation when I looked toward the door. My roommate froze with fear. I was etched in doom, milling out there for a million, yes, a hundred million members of the upper classes. It was a lynch mob, and hatred shown round about them, and I feared exceedingly. And this is one of the upper classmen. Conroy, you not only found a tree, you found a forest. I was scared that day, Mrs. Morris, but the net result was they liked me a little better. And the thing is, they did. After getting over the initial shock and insult of the poem, Pat became uh, rather well liked at the Citadel because he made himself known, because he committed this act of literary courage, of bravery in Shaco magazine, and drew attention and stood up for himself. And he's able to write about all of this to Anne Head. He's being very supportive, being wonderfully supportive of young Pat. Think about how much that means to a young writer to have somebody who is so invested in the real world of literature, in the real world of publishing, on his side as a young person like this. Anne was also sharing with Pat her experiences from the big world of New York publishing. She was sharing correspondence with her agent, with her editors, with her publisher. One of her books, Mr. and Mrs. Bojo Jones, was eventually made into a TV film starring Desi Arnaz Jr. And she was sharing correspondence with Pat about the possibilities of that film too. So as a young person, Pat is learning all of these lessons about major New York publishing from someone who's already invested in that world. Incidentally, Anne, Head, Anne Head's publisher was Doubleday, same publisher that will eventually publish Pat Conroy. So they have that in common as well. What Pat doesn't get to have with Anne Head, unfortunately, is a lifelong friendship. 
uh, because Anne dies not long after he graduates from the Citadel rather suddenly. And this is what Pat had to say about that. This is also from the cookbook. At the time of her death, Mrs. M was the only writer I actually knew by sight. And her untimely and unforeseen death robbed me of a mentor I thought would help me navigate the fearful world of American publishing. I was lucky that she found me as a boy. And whenever I publish a new book, I take a rose or headstone and I place it before her without a word, respecting her detachment as part of the bond between us. I've gotten to know Anne's daughter, Nancy Fody, who is an incredible writer and actress and counselor and all around wonderful human being uh, who honors her mother in some really remarkable ways, one of which is creating a contest in her mother's honor, which we help administer here at the, at the Conroy Center. And I'll mention that again later in our presentation. We'll circle back around to it. But uh, Anne, uh, Anne's daughter, Nancy, wanted to thank me for all the help I was giving her uh, with a lot of different projects. And I said, Nancy, really what I want to know is where your mother is buried. I'd, I'd love to take uh, a couple of roses to her headstone, one for the book of Pat's that came out after he passed away called uh, Low Country Heart, which I've mentioned uh, once or twice already. And the other for a book that I'm a part of called Our Prince of Scribes, writers remember Pat Conroy. And Nancy said, sure, we can go to mom's grave, let's walk. Um, of all the places that grave could be, it's within walking distance of our Pat Conroy Literary Center down here in Buford, uh, and there is uh, Anne's grave and the two roses that I left that day. Uh, so Pat never had that lifelong friendship with Anne the way that he did with Jean and with Bill and with many of his teachers, but he did get this really wonderful ritual and she was incredibly important to his life as a young writer. All of Pat's teachers were so inspirational to him that he decided to become a teacher himself when he graduated from the Citadel. Uh, and first, uh, right here in Buford, uh, back at Buford High School, the same Buford High School that Pat went to as a student himself, taught for two years from 1967 to 1969 at Buford High, not teaching English as many people would expect for the writer Pat Conroy. He's actually teaching government, which is a particularly difficult uh, subject to teach during the Vietnam era, given the questions that he and his students had about what the government was and wasn't doing at the time. He was also teaching psychology and Pat taught psychology very much the same way that his mother had read Gone with the Wind uh, to him. There was no psychological trauma or condition that he could not somehow equate to one of his own family members. So that is how he taught psychology to his students as a series of stories more than anything else. Pat also got to teach another class, and this is really important to understanding the man that Pat was and the man that he would become. This is before Buford High School was integrated. That would not happen until 1970. Uh, but because of a program called Freedom of Choice, there were a lot of African-American students on the, on the campus. Their families were choosing to send, send them to a predominantly white school as a precursor to integration. And Pat wanted to do something to honor those students. After the assassination of Dr. King in 68, some of those students came up to Pat and asked him if he would be faculty advisor for a student organization, what at the time was called the Afro-American Culture Club. And Pat readily agreed to do that, young liberal teacher that he was, but he also wanted to incorporate this into the curriculum. So he created what may have been the first ever African-American studies class taught in any public school in the state of South Carolina. The principal at the time, who was not Bill Delford, uh, only agreed to allow Pat to teach that class if white students would also sign up for it, which may have been a way of saying no without actually having to say no. But Pat was so popular among his students that white students did sign up for it and they made that class possible. And part of the reason Pat was so popular goes back to his psychology class. There was another problem uh, at Buford High School at this time that Pat took it upon himself to solve, not really asking anyone's permission, had to do with teen pregnancy. So still the small town South and Buford High was not ready to have a sex education class. And so there was a correspondingly high um, problem with teen pregnancy at Buford High. So Pat decided to incorporate sex education or more accurately human sexuality into his psychology class. And because of that, the teen pregnancy rate at Buford High actually dropped. Something about hearing sex described by Pat Conroy made teenagers want nothing whatsoever to do with it. It proved to be a very successful tactic. Uh, so Pat was very popular with his students. Here's what he wrote about this. Unfortunately, Pat did not publish a whole lot about his time teaching at Buford High. The novel he was writing when he passed away was gonna circle back around to this about being a first year teacher. 
although he was setting it in Charleston. But every so often you find a really wonderful passage. And here's one of my favorites. I consider the two years in Beaufort when I taught high school as perhaps the happiest time of my life. My attraction to melodrama and suffering had not yet overwhelmed me, but signs were surfacing. No one had warned me that a teacher could fall so completely in love with the students that graduation seemed like the death of a small civilization. It's a beautiful sentiment and increasingly I'm, I'm starting to understand this on many different levels as I get to teach, as I get to work with students as well. Well, here's some good insight into what Pat was like. And this gets us back to the idea of field trips, which remember is something he learned from Gene Norris. Pat wanted to take his psychology class on a field trip to Columbia to go to the state mental health hospital and the state prison. And these are some of the field trip rules that he gave them that day. There will be no rebellion against authority engendered by any real or imaginary generation gap. But there be no drinking, debauching, sinning, and or calling beloved psychology teacher names to be found on bathroom walls. Young maidens will guard themselves in modesty. Prison riots induced by girls wolf whistling at prisoners will adversely affect your grade. And finally this, if you irritate or exacerbate your most esteemed psychology teacher while on trip, here's how to calculate your grade for the semester. Take the number 1,000, then add 4,000, divide the total by 5,000, then subtract one. We have the uh, handwritten set of these rules on display here in the Conroy Center given to us by two of Pat's students from that psychology class who kept it all these years, not because Pat was uh, a famous writer, but because he had been such a remarkable teacher. And this gives us some pretty good insight into what Pat was like at this point. So it's a great thing for us to be able to display here at the Conroy Center and a wonderful thing to get to share in programs like this. So I got to tell you about Pat's teachers from the per perspective of Pat as student. And now I'm gonna reverse that and tell you about Pat as teacher from the perspective of one of his students. And it's this young woman right here. Her name is Valerie Sayers. And she was the daughter of the civilian psychologist at Paris Island the Marine Corps Training Depot here in town when she was a student in Pat's psychology class. So Valerie's father did for a living the thing that Pat Conroy was stumbling around his classroom learning how to teach. She should have been Pat's toughest critic, <clears throat> but here's how she described her teacher, Pat Conroy. <clears throat> Excuse me. He must have called him Mr. Conroy, but that's hard to imagine. Outside class, if we thought we were cool, we referred to him as Pat. When we gossiped, we called him Pat Conroy, one word on one breath, a movie star's name. When he paced our high school psychology classroom, he was all performer, good looking in a Paul Newman, cool hand Luke kind of way, only taller, younger, cooler. He was master of the sudden pause, the beat, the punchline. He told us funny, self-deprecating stories, his fears, his gaps, and we didn't believe a word. Two years out of the Citadel, he was only six or seven years older than we were. But he was Robert Kennedy, Wilt Chamberlain, and the Beatles rolled into one. Sounds like a remarkable teacher, does he not? That is from an essay that Valerie wrote called Golden, uh, which appears in Our Prince of Scribes, writers remember Pat Conroy. So one of a couple of quotes I'll share with you from that book as we go along here. Well, that's Valerie then. Uh, this is Valerie now. She is... Um, Professor of English and the former director of the writing program at the University of Notre Dame, two-time winner of the Pushcart Prize for short fiction. And she was inducted into our state's literary hall of fame in 2018, just as Pat had been inducted in 1988. She is the author of six novels, two of them, A Due East and Who Do You Love, were turned into a film together. And more recently, she's the author of this short story collection, The Age of Infidelity, which just came out a couple of months ago. Pat Conroy was never Valerie's English teacher. Remember, he didn't teach English, but he taught storytelling in, in, in his way in this psychology class. And that was one of many influences that set Valerie on the path to become a writer as well. She's also a board member of our Pat Conroy Literary Center, and she'll be participating in our virtual Pat Conroy Literary Festival in just a couple of weeks. Uh, and she and Pat became lifelong friends as well in the same way that Pat had these wonderful deep friendships with many of his teachers. He also had them with many of his students. That's Valerie on one side of Pat and they are flanked by several other members of that psychology class that Pat taught in 1969. Well, after, um, after teaching those two years at Beaufort High, Pat uh, was not able to continue at Beaufort High and that too had to do with coming of integration 
because of that fear, there are a lot of private schools popping up in Beaufort, what we would now think of as white flight schools, and the population of Beaufort is changing, and there wasn't a need for as many classroom teachers at Beaufort High. So Pat was on a year-to-year -year contract. He was not going to get renewed for the third year in a classroom. He was offered the chance to become assistant principal, but he didn't want it. He wanted to stay in the classroom. He was actually thinking about going into the Peace Corps at this point, and then realized he could have a Peace Corps-like experience without even leaving Beaufort County. And that's what took him out to the Fusky Island, the 1969-1970 school year, first year of teacher integration in South Carolina, meaning that schools were required to have teachers of many races. So Pat was not only the first uh, white school teacher on the Fusky Island, he was also the first male school teacher when he went out there. He was teaching grades five through eight at the Mary Fields School on the Fusky Island. He had no particular experience whatsoever teaching kids this young. He got out there and realized that through no fault of their own, these kids had been denied a quality of education equal to their white counterparts in town, that separate had not been equal at all. And a lot of people would have given up at that point, but Pat Conroy invested himself fully in the education of these kids. He could see that their future was not going to be on this island. They were not gonna live the same lives that their parents lived, and that he needed to teach them about the world. More than that, he needed to show them the world. So he brought guest speakers over to the island uh, to, to speak to the kids. He brought poets and musicians and all sorts of wonderful experts in their fields. Uh, so these kids would get a sense of who was on the world, who was out there. Many of them had never left the island before. They did not know the name of the Atlantic Ocean, even though that's what washes up on their beach. They thought that Savannah was the largest city in the world because it was the only city many of them had ever heard of through no fault of their own, remember. This is, this is not a failing on the part of the kids. It was a failing on the part of the school. And Pat did everything he could to fill in those gaps. But he also wanted to get them off the island, to show them the world and not just tell them about it. So about this time of year, he brought them here in the Beaufort to go trick-or-treating in the point, as we call it, the historic district, therefore, the white district. And word got back to the school district and the school board that uh, Pat Conroy, the liberal white teacher on Defusky Island, is bringing the African-American kids into town. He also took them to Washington, D.C. on a trip that he funded himself. No taxpayer dollars, no ask of the school to support this. In town, uh, you did not go to Washington, D.C. until your senior year of high school. So at that point, Pat Conroy is giving these kids a quality of education that's not only equal to their white counterparts, it's superior to their white counterparts in town. And that too is getting back to the school board and the school district. I wanna share with you um, uh, a view of Pat Conroy from one of his students, just as I did with Valerie. And it's from a young woman who has her hand raised in the middle of this photograph there. Her name is Sally Ann Robinson. That may be a name familiar to some of you. And here's what she said about that year with Pat Conroy as her teacher. That school year was unforgettable for me. Pat was patient and generous. He made every day an adventure while teaching us about history, math, spelling, reading, music, you name it, he taught it. And all the while he was preparing us for the wide world we were gonna face once we left our island. He could take the words in a book and bring them to life for us. We were amazed. I got up every morning wanting to go to school because this wonderful teacher would be there who would make learning fun while opening our eyes to a future we didn't know was ours. And this too is from an essay that appears in Our Prince of Scribes, Spiders Remember Pat Conroy. Well, that's Sally Ann Dare, uh, about 11 years old. Here she is much later in life. She and Pat were also lifelong friends. Sally Ann is now the author of four cookbooks and a short history of the Fusky Island. Pat wrote the foreword to that first cookbook of hers and toured nationally when it came out. She is a sought after celebrity chef. She's also a, a really wonderful tour guide of the Fusky Island. And you've probably seen her at some point on the Food Network or South Carolina ETV or any number of other places. She's been featured in Garden and Gun, and she was in uh, Oprah's magazine, O Magazine, just a couple of issues ago. Really a quintessential figure here in the Low Country now. Uh, but all that began in Pat Conroy's classroom on Defusky Island. Well, what ended in that classroom was Pat's teaching career because of all those wonderful things he did for these students that got back to the school board and the school district at a time when they were not ready for a teacher to be that progressive, to be that liberal. So after a year of teaching uh, on Defusky Island, Pat Conroy was fired for a long list of um, reasons. Some are real, some rare, but unrealistic as well. 
Uh, but Pat was given a chance to resign uh, rather than accept uh, this, uh, this termination. And the school board told him that if he resigned, he would probably be able to get a job somewhere else, uh, maybe not in Beaufort County, maybe not even in South Carolina, but somewhere. But Pat Conroy was the son of a fighter pilot, son of a warrior. So he took the school district to court and he sued for wrongful termination. And right up until the point the judge delivered the verdict, Pat and his lawyer were absolutely convinced they were going to win that trial and Pat was going to go right back into the classroom. But he lost. And with that on his record, he was not able to get a job as a teacher anywhere else. But that lit the spark in him to write The Water is Wide and every book that came after it. Uh, one of those books, and probably the one you're most familiar with, is The Prince of Tides. And in that book, in the character of Tom Wingo, Pat says this, although I think it's very true of Pat Conroy as well. There's no word in the language I revere more than teacher. My heart sings when a kid refers to me as his teacher, and it always has. I've honored myself and the entire family of man by becoming a teacher. Pat was never a teacher again after the Husky Island in the classroom sense of that word, but he never stopped being a teacher in the much larger sense of that word. He was a friend and mentor to many writers, including me, and that's the spirit that we honor here at the Conroy Center. That was the Pat Conroy that I knew much later in life. He was still very much a teacher, first and foremost, always. So when Mr. Conroy passed away March 4th of 2016, uh, we came to understand he had a couple of other lessons to teach us as well. And uh, our Conroy Center really honors that in a lot of ways. We can never write uh, anything as Mr. Conroy wrote it, but we can honor the generous spirit in which Pat Conroy taught. So with that said, I wanna share with you a couple of examples of what the Conroy Center does, and then I'll happily open the floor for your questions. This is, uh, this is the desk I'm um, in right now, in fact. This is Pat Conroy's lighting desk from his Fripp Island home, and it's really the centerpiece to our Conroy Center. We're open uh, from noon to four, Thursdays through Sundays, just a couple of days a week, although the public tends to show up every single day. And if any of us are here and there's a knock on the door, very happy to do a private tour as well. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the projects that we've had with young folks, although that we don't work exclusively with young people. Uh, but we, uh, we are free to visit here in the Conroy Center, but we very happily accept donations. And our donation box is actually made by a group of high school students from May River High School in Bluffton, one town over from where we are here in Bluffton, here in Beaufort, excuse me. Uh, really wonderful metallic sculpture you can see in the photo there. We also have this wonderful art piece from a young artist here in Beaufort named Anthony Johnson, who you can see there uh, in the photograph. Anthony does a style of art called journal art, which means uh, what's on that portrait isn't so much drawn as it is written. Uh, Anthony, very much like Pat Conroy, came here from elsewhere and found himself a wonderful mentor. Her name is Mary Tebow. She runs the Tebow Art Gallery about a block from where I am here at the Conroy Center. And she introduced uh, Anthony to Pat's book, The Water is Wide. So what Anthony did to create this portrait of Pat Conroy is use lines he's quoting from The Water is Wide and then his own stream of consciousness response to those passages. So this portrait is actually done with words that collectively form the shape of that moment. It's a beautiful piece, which we were able to purchase thanks to some generosity from our donors. But um, the thing that we, uh, that we do that I really wanna share with you that impacts the life of one young person in particular, takes us all the way back to this woman here. This is Stephanie Austin Edwards today. If you'll remember, she was a classmate of Pat's on Breaker's Literary Magazine. She was sort of an original witness to Pat and the writer that he would become. And Stephanie has become a great friend to me here in Beaufort. One of the great joys of my Beaufort experience has been getting to know and trust Stephanie and her husband, Paul. And one day she comes into my office and says, wouldn't it be great if we had a high school intern? And this is early in the formation of the Conroy Center when we're still trying to figure out who and what we are and who we can serve. And at that time, I was not really um, that gung-ho about the idea of having a high school intern. I didn't think it was something that we could take on. Uh, and the high school intern she had in mind was a freshman, not a senior, not a junior, a very young person. This is her, it's in Holland Perriman, uh, a remarkably young writer, as it turns out. But at that point, I wasn't quite prepared to take Holland on. But every so often, I hear the voice of Pat Conroy in my head, haunting me in its way. And that particular day, I heard not old man Pat Conroy, but I heard the voice of 16-year-old Pat Conroy saying this, 
if I ever get to be a writer, I'll be nice to every kid I meet. Well, Pat is not here anymore to hold that oath, but I am, Stephanie is, we are. And so we did. Uh, and so I am now in my second year as the embarrassingly, ridiculously proud mentor to young Miss Perryman, who is in many ways the Pat Conroy of Buford High School right now. Best writer, promising student athlete, promising student leader, and a great joy to us here at the Conroy Center. She is also uh, coincidentally one of the finalists for the inaugural Anne Head Literary Prize. And if you will remember, Anne Head was Pat Conroy's first creative writing teacher. <clears throat> this is a prize that Anne's daughter Nancy created last year. And Holland was one of two sophomores along with Emmett O'Brien there who were finalists for it. And the award was won by senior Claire Bowden. Um, and the Conroy Center was a small part of this project, certainly not a big piece uh, the way that Buford High was, but we're all very proud of Holland for being a finalist in that competition. Uh, and there is Holland behind the scenes and very much on the scene at any number of other Conroy Center events. She really has become a central part of everything that we do, not only teaching young people, but teaching older writers as well. <clears throat> And she'll be a big part of our upcoming Conroy Literary Festival, uh, which will be held virtually this year. Uh, so you'll be able to attend on Zoom, very much like you're doing right now, November 5th through 8th. And if you go to our Facebook page or our website, you'll find a lot of information about how to sign up and attend various events of that festival over those days. But what I want to end with before I open our floor for questions here is a bit of fan mail. Uh, we get quite a lot of that here at the Conroy Center. Pat got tons of fan mail when he was alive and he tried to answer as much of it as he could. And there is no more Pat Conroy, but the fact that there is a center, a living legacy that people can visit and can interact with in person or online is very meaningful to a lot of Pat's fans and a lot of writers who didn't necessarily know anything about Pat but have found their way to us since. Uh, and I love getting that fan mail, I absolutely treasure it. But the most interesting piece of fan mail we got is something that came early on from a very unlikely source because in October of 2016, we got a letter from Pat Conroy, who had died in March of 2016, a letter from a deceased person, which is very unnerving if it's ever happened to you. What made it stranger was that it was not a letter from old man Pat Conroy, who we see in that photo. It was actually a letter from young Pat Conroy, from 23-year-old Pat Conroy, from first-year teacher Pat Conroy. And here's how that was possible. It was a letter that Pat Conroy had written in 1968, same year of that family photograph I showed you earlier in our presentation. If you'll remember, that was Pat's first year of teaching at Buford High School. It was a letter he had written that summer to Bill Duffert, that high school principal that we've talked about earlier. Pat was inspired by Dr. Duffert in many ways to become a teacher. And as a young teacher, Pat wanted to thank his mentor, Bill Duffert, for setting him on this path. And in 1968, Pat was in his first year of teaching at Buford High. He's not been to the Fusky, he's not been fired. None of those things have happened to him yet. So this letter is very earnest, uh, written from one teacher to another, a letter of thanks, very much about this moment in 1968. But when we found it uh, in 2016, in Bill Dufford's archives at Newberry College, it also seemed to be a letter from beyond the grave, very much about the moment that we were in, in 2016 because this was when we were about to open the Conroy Center to the public for the very first time, about to announce that what had begun as the Pat Conroy at 70 Festival was gonna continue as our annual Pat Conroy Literary Festival, and about to announce that I was leaving the University of South Carolina Press, where I was director, to become the first director of our nonprofit Conroy Center. And somehow this letter from 1968 seemed to be about all of that as well. It was an amazing discovery. And I want to read to you the end of, of this letter. Uh, and this was again found in the Bill Dufford archive at Newberry College, shared with Dr. Dufford, who shared it with the rest of us. So this is 23-year-old Pat Conroy writing in 1968. I've never understood the dynamics of hero worship. Maybe it was the discovery of the father I never had as a youth and finally found in you. Father who is not only stern, but tender. Father of both the storm and the sun. It is important for you to know this effect you have had, and I believe you know it, but in the shortness and horrible brevity of life, I want to get everything said, everything. Someday I'll exert the same influence over someone, and I want him to tell me, this is immortality. But what I've learned from you, I will pass on, and it will be passed on, and it will be passed on and passed on. 
beautiful, powerful, heartfelt letter from a young teacher to his own mentor, to his surrogate father in many ways. But it's also become in many ways the mission statement of our Pat Conroy Literary Center. It's what we've been doing for this past hour. I've taken the lessons that Pat learned from his teachers and shared with his students and shared with his readers. And I've shared them with you in the hopes that you'll take custody of them and see that they're passed on and passed on and passed on. And for me to get to do that, uh, for this guy who was my friend, my mentor, my teacher in the grand sense of that word is a great honor for me and a real privilege. And it's been a joy to get to share this uh, particular presentation with you all. So I wanna thank you for your attention. And with that said, I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. So I will stop our screen share at this point. So I can see all of you again. Hi, everybody. And you're welcome to turn your microphones